you. In 1873, Mark Twain published a book called The Gilded Age. And in it, he described the vast increases in opulence and in wealth that he witnessed during his time period. And he also described the vast increases at inequality that tended to mark the time. Because after all, this was the time of the Great Gatsby. This was the time of massive consolidation of wealth and of money. And as a new elite of people who worked in industry and people who worked in finance began to emerge, wages stagnated for too many people, the costs of living went up, and life became harder for many people. When we think about this time and the experiences of Mark Twain and the story of the Gilded Age, we often think of the inequality that took place during this time period as the result of globalization or the underwriting of civil war debt. Or else we describe it as just a kind of necessary consequence of a time of rapidly expanding economic growth. And yet this is not the full story because technological innovations of the time in a wide array of industries and a wide array of uh, tools, those devices help spur a new class of people that worked in, um, in industries that were more highly skilled than ever before. They were owners of capital and they were people who took in greater profits than really anyone in America ever had up until that point. And we know about people like John Rockefeller, and we know about people like Andrew Carnegie. But the truth is, is that the inequality that took place during this time period was deeply rooted in technology, and that technology was endemic to what went on during the Gilded Age. This, te this TED Talk is about how artificial intelligence will affect economic inequality. And in particular, it's about how we should work to deal with a rapidly changing economy as digital tools and digitalization begin to affect the workplace. And this is a topic that I've been researching for the past two years. And I first came onto it because I wanted to know what would happen when artificial intelligence a technology that so many people believe will be so deeply transformative that it will change everything. I wanted to know how that tool would affect the basic bargain of what it means to be an American and what it means to participate in this economy. And so I'll begin this talk by first discussing what happened before, what happened during the Gilded Age, what happened during the Industrial Revolution. And then I'll turn to today, what happens now as we begin to embrace artificial intelligence. And then I'll conclude by discussing why we should worry about inequality to begin with. But let's begin with a couple points about technology and technological growth. For starters, technology has been vital to the increases in standards of living and the wealth that we enjoy today. During the prehistoric time period, life was arduous, it was difficult, it was marked by famine, it was marked by disease, and most people were lucky to live to the age of 30. And what's more, this was basically how life was. It rarely ever improved, and it would have taken one million years for humanity to sustain an additional one million people during this prehistoric time. Eventually, however, agriculture came along. And that same level of growth was now possible in 2,000 years. And this was beneficial, but something truly remarkable happened during the Industrial Revolution in the middle of the 18th century. Because during this time, new labor-saving devices and innovations ushered, ushered in a new wave of technological growth, and the economy began expanding to an exponential extent. And today, the global economy grows by the amount that it would have taken a million years to grow by every 90 minutes. And this is why it makes sense that people are so excited about a tool like artificial intelligence that might improve productivity after decades of waning productivity and sluggish productivity growth. 
Now, the question, though, and the main point of this talk is how will artificial intelligence affect the gap between the rich and the poor? And to answer this question, I think we should first begin by considering what happened during the Industrial Revolution. And so, when we look at what happened in Britain, we know that there were these innovations such as the steam engine or the spinning jenny that really changed the constitution of the British economy. But what I think gets told a little bit less is this idea that it was middle skill work, middle wage work, that was primarily susceptible to automation. These were jobs as working as, say, an artisan. And all of this was ripe for automation because these were relatively high paying jobs. They took years to train. And so when these jobs began to,、uh, to be decimated, employers and people who own capital began to hire more workers in low wage and low skill sectors of the economy. And so what we saw during this period, crucially, was A vast polarization in the number of jobs that were available. They were either low wage and low skill on one end, or on the other end, they were high wage and high skill. But what we saw was a stagnating middle. And it's exactly this mechanism where we see job polarization, but also wage polarization. It's exactly this mechanism that causes inequality as a result of technology. And this is exactly what happened during. The Gilded Age, and it was one of the biggest features that marked、uh, the Industrial Revolution as well. And so now we turn to today. Well, for starters, I don't think I need to tell anyone here that we're dealing with some of the worst inequality that we've ever seen. Today, the top 1% of American households owns 20% of all U.S. income. And what's more, The 20 wealthiest Americans take in as much wealth as the bottom half of all Americans combined. This is a level of inequality that we have not seen since the height of the Gilded Age. And so then the question is we're dealing with high inequality, but to what extent has artificial intelligence and digitalization contributed to this high inequality? And the answer to this is complicated because, on the one hand, AI has not really entered the economy in any meaningful way. It's still at a rudimentary stage and it's still only beginning to take an effect. But that being said, there is ample evidence that early digitalization, so computers or the internet, have continued the trends of past technologies that see the decline in middle wage work in favor of low wage, low skill work, and high wage, high skill work. And we can see this in, for example, The destruction of formerly solid middle wage jobs in, say, working as a travel agent or working as a phone operator. Those jobs are gone now. And it took tools like the computer and the internet to get rid of them. And so, as artificial intelligence expands the scope of what can be digital, we should expect that these trends are going to continue. And here I think we get to the most important part of this talk. If there's one point that I hope all of you can take home from this, I hope it's this. Although some people might respond to the argument that technology has been uniquely responsible for the rise of inequality we've seen since around the 1970s,、um, some people might say that it is also a consequence of、uh, bad tax policy. They might say it's a consequence of choosing Federal Reserve chairs that value. Inflation over unemployment, or they might say it's a consequence of、uh, bad education policy. All of that would be true. However, the vast majority of the increase in inequality that has occurred during this period has been a direct result of high wage and high paying、uh, and high skill work taking on more and more of this country's income. They're, they're being paid more, they're more lucrative, and they're more dominant in the economy. And the biggest reason why those jobs are becoming so dominant and becoming more and more lucrative is because of this, country, of this country's increasing reliance on digital skills. As computers and digital technology enter the economy, we value those skills in, say, using computers or in machine learning higher than ever before. And that's why they're increasingly valuable. And so we can't separate. 
the impact of technology from the discussion that we have about today's inequality. And so, despite this, there's a worthwhile question to ask why, why we should even care about this. Because after all, earlier in this talk, I described that the truth is technology has increased human standards of living pretty much across the board. And so if the upwards trajectory of technology ultimately bends upwards and continues to bend upward, why should we care about the gap between the rich and the poor? This is an objection that's worth taking seriously. But I happen to believe that there are serious reasons to not tolerate high levels of economic inequality. And we can begin with the issue of fairness. In this country, there's a dominant mythology and a belief in ensuring equality of opportunity, if not necessarily equality of results. It's embedded within the mythology of this country and the basic bargain of what it means to be an American. And yet, because of the rise of inequality, research has consistently shown that economic mobility, that is your chance to start out from a lower income household and become rich, that's been in decline. And so that basic bargain is at stake right now. And there are many reasons for this, but effectively it comes down to investment. The lowest income people and lowest income communities are chronically underinvested in. And on the other side, the richest people have the money to send their kids to the best schools in the country and to kickstart their children's careers with all the things that they need to be successful. And this is why it's unsurprising that the best math students in lower income communities have as much of a likelihood of becoming an innovator as the wealthiest math students and also the worst math students. And so beyond this, even if we don't buy this economic argument against inequality, even the people who benefit from this inequality because they're on the receiving end of some of these higher wages, even those people should be deeply worried about the gap. And that's because economic inequality also makes our economy less secure. And it does so because as economic uh, mobility declines, competition is more difficult to sustain. And as a result, economic growth is more fleeting, it doesn't last as long. And so the good times are shorter lived. But then on the other side, recessions, the bad times, those are more painful because lower income communities are less able to afford unexpected additional financial obligations. And none of this is the marker of a stable democracy or a healthy economy. But let's say we don't buy any of these economic arguments against having high levels of inequality. There's also ample psychological, political, and social evidence that high levels of inequality also correlate with a number of societally corrosive effects. So for instance, high levels of inequality, they correlate with the uh, rate of depression, they correlate with the homicide rate, it correlates with deaths of despair from, say, suicide or from overdoses, and it correlates with the rise in conspiracy theories and the rise in anti-immigrant sentiment as people try to develop explanations to explain their feelings of stagnation. And what's more, the rise of an illiberal and intolerant populism that we are experiencing and in the midst of today, that can be directly traced to the rise of inequality. And so if we want to combat all these issues and work to ensure a more inclusive, a more equitable, and a fairer future for this country where people are really given a shot to compete, we're going to need to tackle the, the issue of inequality at its source. Because if not, artificial intelligence will make the inequality we have thus far experienced just a prelude to what's to come. It'll be the storm before the hurricane. So what can we do? Throughout history, reducing inequality has been incredibly arduous, and it's been incredibly difficult. After the Gilded Age, for example, it took the Second World War and the dire need of the US federal government raising taxes in order to reduce and level inequality. And this has pretty much been the story throughout all of human history. Um, throughout 
most of recorded economic history, inequality has only ever declined through some sort of catastrophe or another. It was a civil war. It was government collapse. It was some sort of mass military mobilization. Or it was plague. But we don't need to wait for some sort of catastrophe to work to combat the effects of inequality. Because there are solutions that exist today, and there are solutions that we know about. And this includes, for example, investing in worker retraining programs, investing in welfare programs that help prop up the most vulnerable people. And it includes making sure our education system is more meritocratic and improving democracy from the ground up. And I have optimism at our chances of beating inequality that's caused by AI because I know that my generation is tolerant, I know that we're innovative, I know that we're tenacious. And so despite the fact that throughout history, nobody's really ever succeeded in beating inequality, that doesn't mean that we have to. Thank you.